The tenth common Christian teaching is our teaching uh, about the practice of the Lord's Supper. Uh, John Wesley was not unusual in that uh, teaching. Charles Wesley wrote many, many hymns about the Lord's Supper. In fact, he wrote a 1749 collection of hymns, excuse me, 1745 collection of hymns upon the Lord's Supper uh, with a theological treatise that he and his brother had derived uh, from Daniel Brevent's book on the Christian sacrament and sacrifice. Now, I like to say that there were four historic views of the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. On the far right, I hope that's your right, uh, was the most conservative traditional view that had been inherited from the Middle Ages. Uh, that was uh, the view that we call transubstantiation. Uh, it's a very particular teaching. You may think that means the true body and blood of Christ is there. That's not just what transubstantiation means. Transubstantiation means that the bread and wine that are consecrated in the Mass completely disappear. They cease to exist, and they are entirely replaced by the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Our articles of religion rule out that point of view. On the far left uh, is the view usually associated with Ulrich Zwingli, but also with a lot of evangelicals and liberal people through Protestant history. This is the view that emphasizes what human beings do in the Lord's Supper. It is principally uh, a means of remembering what Christ did. And they point to the words uh, where Jesus says, do this east any mean anamnesin, do this for me and my anamnesis or my memory. Uh, and that it's a, a kind of symbolic way of talking about our faith in Jesus Christ. Is Christ present? Yes, Christ is present uh, in the same way as when two or three are gathered in his name. But I'd say on this particular point of view, uh, there is not a unique presence of Christ in the Supper. Now, our United Methodist Confession of Faith can be read in a kind of Zwinglian way. I think it's in tension with our Articles of Religion in that particular respect. But between transubstantiation on the one hand and the Zwinglian view on the other hand, there were two mediating positions that had been taken during the time of the Reformations. Uh, and I want to describe those to you and say where I think John and Charles Wesley came down on this issue. The position historically taken by Lutherans was that the true human body and blood of Jesus Christ are present on earth when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, Bread and wine do not cease to exist, so this is not transubstantiation. But along with the existing elements of bread and wine are the true human body of Jesus Christ and blood of Jesus Christ, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, present on earth. Okay, uh, We used to call that consubstantiation. But Lutherans don't like to use that term uh, anymore. It's kind of a technical issue. Luther actually didn't like the word substance. So to say consubstantiation may be inappropriate to his period. The idea, though, is that the presence of Jesus Christ is present with con the elements of bread and wine. There was another point of view that was the view that John Calvin had taken uh, in contrast to the position of Zwingli. It was the view that most of the Reformed churches, Presbyterian and Congregational, as well as churches that are called Reformed, had taken. And it's the view that uh, we've come to believe most Anglicans held in John Wesley's time. On this point of view, you cannot say, as Lutherans and Catholics did, that the true human body of Jesus Christ is present on earth, because Calvin and others pointed out the body of Christ had ascended to heaven, and a body can't be in two places at the same time. Nevertheless, Calvin and others argued, there is a power present. Uh, there is an exousia, a virtus in Latin present, as if Jesus Christ were bodily present. 
in the New Testament, there's the story of the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and she, it says, uh, sh she was healed, but it says Jesus felt exousia, power, go out from him. In Latin, the word is virtus, power, and in fact, in the old King James version of that uh, gospel lesson, it says Jesus felt virtue go out from him. So there's a, a term virtue that's a uniquely uh, reformed way of speaking of this distinctive power of Christ. It is almost like Jesus' body and blood or bodily present. In fact, it feels exactly the same to human beings. It's the same power. It's just that the literal body and blood of Christ are in heaven, and the power that would come from that body and blood are present on earth. It deserves our highest uh, level of respect and admiration and reverence as we approach that divine power and presence of Jesus Christ. This is exactly the way Charles Wesley expresses it. I'm grabbing the principal textbook of Methodist theology here, the hymnal, and I'm turning to hymn number 626. Uh, it is from one of Charles Wesley's hymns on the Lord's Supper. Uh, we entitle it, O the Depth of Love Divine. The question that Charles Wesley is asking in this text, in this poem that becomes a hymn for us, is how could something as simple as bread and wine convey the power and presence of God? Oh, the depth of love divine, the unfathomable grace. Who shall say how bread and wine God into us conveys? How the bread his flesh imparts, how the wine transmits his blood, fills his faithful people's hearts with all the life of God. Let the wisest mortal show how we the grace receive. Feeble elements bestow a power not theirs to give. Who explains the wondrous way how through these the virtue came? These the virtue did convey, yet still remain the same. They still remain bread and wine, and yet they convey that power, that virtue, that presence of Jesus Christ. I think there's little doubt uh, that this point of view, what some scholars call virtualism, uh, is the view that uh, the Wesleys took of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and why they were so reverent about the celebration of the Lord's Supper, uh, why John Wesley would later say in his letter to the North American Methodist, let every elder celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. Uh, it was a practice in which John Wesley engaged every two to three days in his own devotional practice, uh, and in fact, the United Methodist Church in 2004, in adopting a Eucharistic study entitled This Holy Mystery, encourages congregations to move back to the Wesleyan, the biblical, the historic norm of receiving the Lord's Supper weekly.